Please be seated. Well, good morning. Today is one of those days where the night before I go onto my social media and I see all these posts about people quaking in fear. They're clergy, afraid to preach today's gospel and <laughs> lessons and the lessons that we received this morning from the Old Testament and in the Psalm. Uh, words of woe, words of warning, not a lot of words of comfort this morning. The prophet Isaiah prophesied, for example, the destruction of Jerusalem that actually did happen, describing Judah as a vine that uh, the grower uh, was about to destroy because it had failed to grow the good grapes that it provided the, the harvest of justice and righteousness that uh, was expected. And in, in the, in the quote that uh, I, I bring home is, God expected justice, but got bloodshed. God expected righteousness, but got cries of help, cries for help. And the gospel lesson is tough too. We hear something that's hard for us to imagine Jesus saying, if, we, if, our, if the Jesus that we think of is the one who's always comforting and consoling us. No, this morning the text, Luke remembers Jesus um, giving us a, a word of, of, of warning. I came to cast fire upon the earth, Jesus says. How I wish it was already ablaze. And, and, and the, the words that really strike at me. Do you think I have come to bring peace to the earth? Well, yeah, he's the prince of peace, right? <laughs> and he says, no, no, I have come instead to bring division. And then he describes a civil war. Father will square off against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, etc. So how are these words of scripture, the one word of God for us in 2022 in Rochester, New York? For our congregation, I bet, particularly this group that I see here this morning, the Jesus' claim that he didn't come to bring peace, but to bring division, might not be so hard to recognize. Because last year, if you recall, we worked verse by verse through the Gospel of Mark. And, and so we can remember Jesus bringing judgment in, throughout his ministry upon several institutions, and particularly upon the temple state and the oligarchy that had been entrusted with its leadership, its management. And he condemned it again and again. And, and like Isaiah, Jesus forecast that the temple would be destroyed, um, and, and destroyed for a particular reason, because the ruling oligarchy had failed to share, failed to share the abundance that God had provided for the purpose of us all flourishing together. And instead, they had hoarded it for themselves and they had created structures of injustice, structures that entrapped the poor, entrapped the widow, entrapped the immigrant in despair and with little hope of anything changing, little hope of escape. And because we did our close reading of the Gospel of Mark, we can recall how Jesus said God would rise up a new temple in three days and that the temple was himself. Jesus' followers would be the new temple of which he is the cornerstone. And he said repeatedly that following him along the way of love would be alienating. It would be things that it would be a thing that we would do that would actually cause us to be rejected. It would cause estrangement. Because those who follow Jesus belong to him and therefore make choices. And those choices often go against the popular tide. And so the one word of God would be like a flame. It would be like a sword. Pitting father against son, mother against daughter as our choices to follow Jesus say no to certain paths, say no to paths that our tribes might be proposing with great fanfare and sloganeering. 
And that brings to mind, I think, Mark's recollection. I hope for you it rem you remember. Um, Mark's recollection as the Jewish nation in the years, the, the decade of the 60s, you know, became engulfed in civil war of Jesus completely subverting the recruiting slogan of people who lived in his time, who uh, pressed um, for all of the Jewish people to uh, revolt against the powers that be, to revolt against Rome and the and the uh, those who cooperated with them, and those who who pushed Jesus and and his followers in his time to embrace violence, to to engage in insurrection against the Roman people, and the slogan that they used to recruit people into that effort, if you remember, was "Take up your cross." But of course, the really cool thing is that Jesus took what they were saying, that recruiting slogan, which meant take up your cross, be willing to die, be willing to be crucified So that in our battle for nationhood against Rome, he took it and turned, stood it on his head and turned it into take up your cross means following Jesus along the way of love as he inaugurated his peaceable kingdom. And of course, taking up your cross was not a call, is never a call, to pick up your gun. It's a call to pick up your love. A call to love your neighbor in the way God always intended. And loving like that, Jesus said repeatedly, will get you crucified. Take up your cross. As you know, a submarine veteran, like myself, a Navy veteran, heard cries in our country for civil war and responded to them this week. And he lost his life when he attempted an attack on the Cincinnati FBI, FBI office. And yesterday, you may have seen the news today, yesterday in, in Arizona, uh, late at night, you'd have to have been looking at the pictures, but, but, but uh, they assaulted my eyes, seeing uh, an FBI office in, in Arizona basically surrounded by free citizens exercising their Second Amendment rights, uh, surrounding the FBI office with assault weapons, AR-15s and the like, hunting weapons, et cetera, as well. Uh, and yesterday also, one thing that I, that I have already shared with you uh, that happened was Christians gathered in a church not far from here in Batavia, and uh, they had a rally to join uh, a movement, a movement that we've talked about. And they were told a few things that this movement espouses. Again, the church hosting them, giving them the pulpit. America is the new Israel. America is the means through which God is bringing about God's purposes. America was and is intended to be a Christian nation. Others are welcome here, but Christian laws should prevail. They were told it's time, repeatedly, to take our country back. Now, if you've heard this kind of rhetoric before, you, and if you inquire into it and ask, what does it mean, from whom are we to take our country back? The answer is clear in the denunciation of those they see as other, those who allegedly were stealing our country from us, the Jew the Muslim, the immigrant, those whose slogan is Black Lives Matter, the coastal educated elite, which is perhaps some of us, who embrace gay marriage and who are rethinking how gender functions in our lives. All of these, they were told, are great existential threats to our nation, and it's time to take our country back by force, if necessary. This morning, I ask all those who support this movement to consider one question. And, and along with those who, who support this movement, those who are encouraging these calls for civil war, if, if, if you're not in both camps, just consider one question. You may be wearing a t-shirt that declares you are forgiven. 
You may be wearing a t-shirt that has an image of the cross on it, or perhaps an American flag with the cross overlaid on it. What do these things mean? To put it another way, in the letter that Charlie just read to us from, uh, no, Jim just read to us from, from uh, Paul in his letter to the church at Corinth, Paul spoke about what God has done for us. He, he encapsulated the good news in just a few words. He, he said that Jesus is, God has given Jesus to us as our wisdom, and then he named three other things. He's given Jesus to us as our righteousness, or we might translate that as justification. You may rec recognize that jargon to say that you are justified by grace through faith, right? Justification, or as I would urge us to translate it, rectification. All of these words mean, uh, they, describe, they point to our conviction that God has acted to make things right with God, make our status right with God. God has made us right with God justification. So Jesus is that for us. And Jesus is our sanctification. And Jesus is our redemption. So what does that mean? Do you, what does it mean if you believe and if you live your life as though those things are true? How does that have, those things have any traction in your life? What is a life that knows itself to be rectified, sanctified, and delivered look like? And real importantly, does that describe your life? Right now, Sajina and I are teaching our youngest daughter and our youngest son the meaning of the Scout Law. I've shared that with you before. And it's a blast because, uh, you know, eight-year-olds come up with crazy definitions and sometimes they get incredible insights as they reflect on these things. And so we're, we're talking around the table. What does it mean to be trustworthy? What does it mean to be helpful? What does it mean to be reverent? Now, the answer, of course, is only understood through demonstration. We actually have to demonstrate what it means to be trustworthy. We have to live it out. We have to provide an example of that. We have to perform these things so that children can imitate them. Well, the same is true of big theological concepts like rectification, sanctification, and redemption, or deliverance, as I often call it. You can't really comprehend what these words mean unless you see them. You can't look in a dictionary and really get it. The only way we comprehend big technical theological words that describe our most essential theological convictions is if we have examples, is if we're able to observe how people's lives are actually transformed. Transformed when they live as though those convictions are true. You have to have examples. And the people who give us those examples, our exemplars, we call saints. In other words, we know the content of words like sanctification, rectification, and redemption by observing people who actually respond responsibly to the good news that they themselves have been rectified, sanctified, and delivered by Jesus. So, again, what does a life that knows itself to be rectified, sanctified, and delivered by Jesus look like? You're wearing it on your t-shirt. What does it mean? Now, you might ask, why such questions matter. I hope to persuade you of something today, I have to confess. There are those, you see, who say that these theological convictions should not matter to you. They're things that we talk about in church, but outside of church, they don't really have any relevance. They, they, at most, should matter to you only within the walls of the church so you can understand what the preacher's saying. But they are out of place in the so-called real world. My hope is that I can persuade you that that's not true. That, in fact, living our lives as though that we know that we have been rectified, sanctified, and delivered is perhaps 
uh, one of the most important things that we Americans, American Christians, I should say, can do to avoid suffering the destruction that folks are openly promising us in our civic discourse this week. Let me give you an example of the thesis I hope to persuade you to reject. It came from the 1930s. In 1933, many German Christians believed that the church's task was to proclaim the gospel within the church, but that it ought not teach instructions for daily life in the world. The law one was to obey in the world was solely the nation's civic law. And so there was an understanding that these things were divided. The church should stay in its lane. And the state should stay in its lane. But what that meant to more than half of the German Christians in 1933 was that the church was to welcome the expected, the hoped for benefits of the new German Reich, the new German nationalism, and embrace the laws that it created. And so the idea that was very common, and I'm talking about 1933, not 1943, 1933, the idea that was very common at that time was by submitting myself to the laws of this movement, to the, to the popular ideas of this movement, I am being obedient to God and heaping no guilt upon myself. If something evil happens from it, well, then the obedient subjects will not be guilty. We were just following this law of our community, this law of, the, of our civic discourse, this, this popular tide. We were just part of that. If anybody is guilty, it's the leaders. Very common belief in 1933. And the basic thesis that underlies this is that there are actually two spheres of life. Within the church, we should preach the gospel and teach people how to love Jesus. Maybe even sell some t-shirts with that on it. But out there in the real world, the conviction that you've been rectified, claimed by Jesus, and delivered by him has no bearing. In particular, those things have nothing to even say about how we ought to think about our national politics. That's the thesis that I, I pray I can persuade you to reject. With that in mind, let's actually look at the wisdom that Paul described as foolishness to the Greeks. That first word, however you translate it, righteousness, rectification, rec you know, uh, uh, justification, Dietrich Bonhoeffer described those things as costly grace. Remember, we've talked about this. Grace is our experience of God's presence. It's our experience of God's real presence in our lives, in our time, in our moment. That, that grace is costly because it is unmerited and it is absolutely complete. God has chosen to be with us and has unilaterally done that which was necessary to make that possible, to make our reconciliation with God possible. So what we're talking about here, when we talk about these technical words, is true forgiveness. It's not as if our sins were apparently forgiven. It's not as though our sins were in the abstract forgiven. No, they were actually, in fact, forgiven. Not forgotten, but put aside, put in the past, so that they are no longer an obstacle for us to actually live with God. I hope that we can all agree on that. That's, that's Christianity 101. In 1933, many German Christians believed in German exceptionalism. That is, they believed that God has a special preference for German people and the German nation and in contrast with other nations. I really appreciated one of the lyrics in Churches one, uh, 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 the Church's One Foundation today when it talked about that word to all the nations because that's what we claim. Now, as I've mentioned, many Americans who are now polishing their assault weapons say the same thing. They speak of an American exceptionalism, that we are the chosen people. But that claim, I hope you can recognize, just 
extending this idea of justification is completely contradicted by the one word of God. Completely. The conviction that we are rectified, the conviction that God has given us costly grace. For scripture teaches that who was rectified and why? All people were justified. All people were equally in need of forgiveness for all sins. But being German in 1933 and being American in 2022 have nothing to do with the grace that God grants us. There is nothing whatsoever that you and I contribute to what God has done, to God's forgiveness. It is God's act. It is God's blessed assurance. It is God who has forgiven us. We are forgiven alone. And only God has done that which frees us from our bondage to sin. So the idea of America having a, a special relationship with God is completely unfounded scripturally. Costly unmerited grace is offered not just to our nation but to all humans now our nation i will say is special but not in that way it's not because god has a special preference for us as a people or for our government the united states of america it's it is to the extent that we live in ways that bear witness to the love that he desires for all people Bonhoeffer reminded us that the grace that we receive is costly, but many of us prefer what Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. I love that paradoxical phrase, cheap grace. A lot of people go, huh? What in the world is cheap grace? Is that an oxymoron? But Bonhoeffer knew what he was talking about. He said that grace is cheap when we fail to recognize that grace means that we are released from our sins but what it doesn't mean is that we are released from the claims that Jesus makes upon us. Jesus sets us free to receive our life from him, to commit our life to him. Now, some folks think of grace the way some of us might think of our doctors. Once we recover, we no longer need the doctor. Some folks act the same way about Jesus. Once we accept our forgiveness, acknowledge it, we have no need for Jesus. Grace is cheap when we use it when we need it to enable us to return to Egypt, to return to our old ways of sinning, to return to our old lives, to go back to the ways of being that actually bind us in sin once again. So if we wear t-shirts this morning that announce to the world we are forgiven and also encourage Americans to engage in civil war, then one has to consider to what extent are you simply manifesting your preference for cheap grace? Grace was cheap when German Christians celebrated their forgiveness in church and walked out of the church and went out into the world and embraced the slogans of an ethnically pure Germany underneath the one Führer. And grace is cheap when American Christians do the same, when we celebrate our forgiveness in church and go out into the world to trumpet the slogans of an anti-immigrant, xenophobic, Anglo-Protestant populism seeking to, tur to turn the USA into a Christian nation. Now Paul also says that Jesus is our sanctification, which is to say that Jesus is that which makes us holy. To borrow from Karl Barth, Jesus sa sanctifies us by causing us to experience his costly grace as command. Grace as command, another paradoxical phrase, which I love. Grace as command. That is, we experience grace as Jesus' claim upon our lives. We, we don't take grace seriously if we don't also take seriously that claim, this action that God commands of us. And Jesus' claim upon us 
is upon not just our life here in the sanctuary, but upon our whole lives. You can't separate grace from command, is, is the point. And what does that claim look like? Well, we've spent many years working through these claims that Jesus makes upon us. And I'll just give a summary of, of, of what we have learned again and again in our own studies of Scripture that Jesus is always talking about. You know, he, he's, he's taught us we don't value things above people. People don't serve things. Things serve people. And Jesus has taught us that freedom is not about being an individual with no boundaries. Rather, he's taught us that we actually discover what freedom is in fellowship. And, and Jesus has taught us that love is impossible without truth. Which is a real interesting thing since in here in our country this day, in this rhetoric, so many of us have no longer concerned ourselves with truth. But he also has taught us that truth can only be spoken in love. Truth and love are inseparable. They intersect. And he's taught us that the measure of the goodness of our common life is the extent to which the least among us receive their share, which brings us right back to the song of the vineyard from the prophet Isaiah. I expected to hear righteousness. I expected to hear and see a harvest of justice. But instead, I heard nothing but pleas for help, and I saw bloodshed. And finally, Jesus taught us that all life is precious and worthy of preservation. So this is a summary of the things that I think Jesus, you know, when, if we were to unpack what does a sanctified life look like, well, it prioritizes these things. So how to respond responsibly in any particular moment is, of course, always an open question that we have to answer in each and every moment. But, but to what extent does the pursuit of these things describe your life? As you craft your bellicose prose inciting other citizens to civil war, to what extent is that behavior fulfilling Jesus' call upon you to use his grace to choose a sanctified life? We've been delivered for a purpose. Jesus' claim upon us, his divine command tells us that it's not how we, that, that, that we will indeed encounter people that are difficult to love, that we uh, will find people who uh, are disagreeable to us, people who are our enemies, who are not our friends. But his claim to us, his divine, divine command of us is that that is not actually how we are to see things. He commands us not to look upon our fellow citizens in terms of what they mean to us. He tells us to set aside all such concerns, instead to love them as ourselves, to, to see them and look upon them not as what they mean to us, but rather in terms of what they mean to God. And what they mean to God is they are God's beloved too. So as a matter of principle, our service of love cannot be denied to anyone, any of those that some of us would like to exclude from this Christian nation that we're talking about building. So my question for you this morning is, does your life this morning testify to the world what it means to be forgiven? If someone looks at your life, can they say, so that's what the life of someone who knows they're forgiven looks like? Does your life bear witness to what it means to believe that Jesus has made you and called you to be holy? Does your life resonate like the life of one who knows themselves to have been delivered by Jesus? Delivered, liberated for a holy purpose. May each of us recommit ourselves this morning to responding responsibly to this good news that God has given us at Christ as our wisdom and that his way alone is costly grace and his gracious command that we offer ourselves in love to not just those we prefer but to all of our creatures all of God's creatures in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit Amen